My topic is uh, bile duct injury and its intraoperative aspects. My talk is going to be on the following topics, a bit of an introduction, risk factors to um, bile duct injuries, uh, classification of bile duct injuries, what do we do to prevent bile duct injuries, how do we manage them intraoperatively, um, and some concluding remarks. So we know laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a, is a common operation. Uh, about 7,50,000 operations are done every year in the U.S. It's become a gold standard for uh, cholecystiasis. Bile duct injury uh, is, a, is, a, is a recognized complication. It is quite rare. It's only about 03 to 0.7%. However, it's important because it has an, uh, a significant uh, uh, impact on the quality of life, has some serious medical legal liabilities. The unfortunate uh, aspect of this bile duct injury is that uh, 70 to 85% of the bile duct injuries don't re get recognized at the time of the uh, index operation. With regards to the risk factors, well, there are about five risk factors which I have enumerated here uh, as being risk factors for bile duct injury, of which I've listed four here and one on a separate slide for a reason that I will I will, I will let you know uh, in a little while. Uh, anatomical factors, variations of biliary anatomy. Uh, the, the patient factors, if the patient is obese, if he's got underlying liver disease, those are risk factors. And then the disease itself with the gallbladder, whether it's acute cholecystitis, empyema, or a chronically shrunken gallbladder, or at the time of surgery, if there's excessive bleeding at the callus triangle, there's an increased risk of bile duct injury. Now, the studies have shown that uh, if the operation is a planned operation, the risk is about 0.09%, whereas if it is done in an emergency situation, it can go as 1.3, 1.5%. There is the issue of learning curve and the surgical technique. I have specifically uh, mentioned this uh, as, as, as a as a separate slide, because uh, uh, many a times this can be a reason for bile duct injury. It's an easily avoidable reason, and I've called it as human factors, surgeon factors. Uh, being able to do the operation confidently is good, but then overconfidence is, 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 is not advisable. And it's, it has been reported that when the surgeon has crossed about 200, 250 cases, the, um, the, the, the issue of overconfidence comes in. It shouldn't come in, but then that's when uh, bile duct injuries can occur. The, um, the, 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 the desire to finish the operation quickly, fatigue, tiredness, which may have been due to some major operation done prior to the lap coli, and then the hesitation on the surgeon's part to convert it to an open procedure, thinking that it might be deemed as a failure. Uh, last but not the least, not having colleagues around to help you when you are in trouble. These are significant uh, human factors contributing to bile duct injury. Now, how do we classify this? You've heard this a few times in today's uh, um, um, discussions. Uh, the most common ones are the Bismuth classifications and the Strasbourg classification. Bismuth was in way back in 1982. It was in the open era. It was based mainly on the level of injury from the hilum, whereas Strasbourg is something that we use more commonly these days, and it is more relevant in the laparoscopic era. There are other classifications like McMahon's, uh, which basically divides the um, liver injury, the biliary injuries to lacerations less than 55%, 25%, and lacerations more than 25%. But the, the one that was designed by Stuart Way in 2007 is quite interesting because it not only talks about the anatomy like the other classifications, but it also talks about the mechanism of injury, as in whether it was a scissors related injury or a diathermy injury or a um, uh, energy device injury and so on. But this must just to summarize one, two, three, four, five. One is uh, at the common hepatic duct, more than two centimeters. Two is less than two centimeters. Three is at the level of the hilum, but the connection between the right and the left is preserved. Four is above the level of the hilum, and the right and the left systems are completely separated. And five is when there is a right posterior sectal duct uh, injury, either alone or with a common hepatic duct injury. So Strasbourg uh, is slightly more complicated than the Bismuth. Um, uh, the, 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 the E of Strasbourg, I mean, it goes as A, B, C, D, E. The E of Strasbourg is nothing but the one to fives of bismuth. So you just have to extrapolate the one, two, three, four, five as E1, E2, E3, E4, E5 of Strasbourg. The A, B, C, and D are fairly straightforward. A is a, is a relatively minor injury, just a cystic duct leak or a leak from a minor hepatic duct. B is when the, uh, the injury results in 
occlusion of that aberrant right hepatic duct. C is when there's occlusion on one side and spillage on the other side. This is the kind of injury that you don't detect on ERCP because the bile leak is coming from the other end of the injury. And uh, D is what we call as lateralizing injuries. So that's uh, basically an amalgamation of the two classifications together. Right, so what do we do to prevent a bile duct injury? It can't be stressed enough, the critical view of safety. Um, the callus triangle and uh, there should only be two structures that go from the liver area into the gallbladder. One has to be the cystic duct, the other has to be the cystic artery. Nothing else should be in sight in that particular area. If you can't achieve that sort of a dissection, you you are perfectly okay to go for something called anti-grade dissection. A subtotal cholecystectomy is something that should be considered if, the, uh, if there are other uh, factors which are precluding a clear and a thorough dissection at the callus uh, triangle, such as if there is a very uh, bad liver or if there's lots of veins in the, in the callus triangle, which might happen in cases like extrahepatic portal veil obstruction and so on. Uh, it's quite important, particularly for the beginners, to look at the uh, anatomical landmarks before they go ahead with the dissection to prevent a bile duct injury. And the two classic landmarks is the rubius sulcus, which is which is often which is prominent in about 80 to 90 percent of the uh, patients at the time of laparoscopy, and the other is the the callus node. So, so of, of the seven points that you see on the screen, the first four are purely uh, technical, purely what you see and what you do. Um, at the time of laparoscopy. But the last three <coughs> are basically adjuncts. Um, adjuncts that you can offer at the time of uh, uh, the operation to make the operation um, uh, at a decreased risk of uh, bile duct injury. And that's the IOC, laparoscopic ultrasound, and the fluorescent pelagiography, uh, which we shall see in a bit more detail in the next few slides. Next slide, please. So IOC, intraoperative cholangiogram, <clears throat> it's been practiced for a very long time, several decades now. Um, basically, it's a catheter that goes into the cystic duct um, after adequate dissection of the callus triangle. Patient is in the Trendelenburg position, a C-arm fluoroscopy is required. And the goal of IOC is to clarify the uh, biliary anatomy, to identify stones, and to prevent bile duct injuries. Now, there are some surgeons who have used it routinely for all laparoscopic cholecystectomies, but then with the, ad with the advent of excellent MRCPs and excellent preoperative um, uh, investigation modalities, the, 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 the incidence of IOC is going, going down um, uh, globally. If you look at the SAGES website, they say it's indicated in deranged LFTs, jaundice, unclear anatomy, CBD, more than 7 mm, cystic duct more than 3 mm, but then the, the same document very clearly summarizes it and, uh, and they call it as a position statement. This was published in 2017, wherein they say IOC, sh uh, you know, surgeons should know how to use IOC liberally. They should be familiar with the indications. However, uh, uh, you know, it's, its routine use remains controversial. So they've said very categorically, IOC may decrease the risk of bile duct injury, but then its routine use remains controversial. Laparoscopic ultrasound came as an alternative to IOC, and it uh, picked up uh, uh, pace uh, quite quickly, simply because there's no radiation exposure. Uh, it's less cumbersome. It's easier to do in the operating room, which is which which it doesn't require much of space, and if Obviously, the, the surgeon needs to know how to do how to do the ultrasound and how to read the ultrasound. But then, if that learning curve is passed, the operating time is significantly less compared to an IOC. The, uh, the it just uses the standard ports, the four ports. The ultrasound probe is placed on the hilum and it's uh, basically uh, massaged down the um, uh, common bile duct all the way up to the duodenum. There are numerous studies which have compared the laparoscopic ultrasound with the IOC, and um, and most of the studies say that uh, the, uh, the, the, the the results are equivocal. However, some studies say that the pickup rate of bile stones with laparoscopic ultrasound is slightly more. Near infrared fluorescent cholangiogram, it's a it's a novel technique. It's a it's a relatively new technique. Has been around for about a decade, a preoperative injection of a dye called indocyanin green. This is basically excreted in the bile. Now, this dye emits light at 830 nano nanometers, and, and this light is 
uh, illuminated with uh, near infrared light and it's uh, uh, it's surprisingly a very very um, easy way uh, of delineating the the biliary tree because the anesthetist is able to do it for you at the head end it is safe it is uh, um, it takes less time than any of the previous modalities and it's also cheaper so um, the papers right now they say that this technique obviously it's not available in all the institutions but then if this technique is properly employed it has a potential to decrease bile duct injury worldwide at a lower cost but then as i said before these are just adjuncts there is nothing to replace accuracy and uh, care during surgery and then um, and, and and the and the emphasis on uh, critical view of safety i mean if a surgeon can get a uh, dissection like the one that you can see on the screen there you don't really need any of these adjuncts uh, uh, so the aim uh, particularly for the trainee surgeons should be to focus on uh, the, the the best practices and the safe principles and aim to achieve this sort of a um, of a dissection uh, and then you could add the other things to your armamentarium right so if despite all your efforts a bile duct injury occurs so what are the things that you should you are the operating surgeon the bile duct injury has occurred and and there are things that need to be going through your mind so what, what are these things number one you know are you able to tell where the injury is the location it has a huge bearing on what you do uh, is it just a leak or have you actually occluded something you got to answer these questions in your mind and then you got to do a bit of a, a replay of whatever you've done you know in your mind and think Could, could it be the scissors that had caused the problem, or was it the diathermy, or was it the harmonic that I opened? So make a mental picture of that. And very, very important: um, uh, have you have you also damaged uh, the, the, the 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 vascularity? You know, is the right hepatic artery also clipped, or because the the studies have shown that when there is an associated vascular injury. Uh, which can happen in about 70%, particularly in major major bile duct injuries, the outcome is is poor if the vascular if the vascular uh, um, uh, co component is not adequately dealt with. So um, so these are the things that you have to have in your mind. And lastly, uh, how experienced are you in dealing with this problem, and how equipped is your hospital in dealing with this problem after you've done this operation and got the patient to the uh, recovery room. So what do you do? First of all, don't panic. Now, if it means that you have to convert the operation into an open operation, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. Um, obviously, if you have the laparoscopic expertise, go ahead. But if not, convert it to open. Because the goal is not um, finishing the operation with a few holes or with a cut in the abdomen. Rather, the goal should be, number one, elimination of bile leakage. Number two, adequate drainage. Number three, ensuring that the the ductal length is not compromised and number four whatever you do is a tension free repair so the the buzzword here is immediate recognition as i said before only 20 to 30% 15 to 30% get recognized on table and that shouldn't be the case if there is a problem the surgeon should be able to recognize it immediately the second thing is a timely intervention an immediate intervention if you have the expertise an expert GI hepatobiliary surgeon, if he's able to recognize it and deal with it immediately, there's nothing like it. It gives you the best results. However, if it is recognized by the inexperienced surgeon and if it is repaired um, uh, inappropriately, then the long-term results are poor because you only have one good opportunity to deal with these kind of problems. So therefore, the, 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 the key here is if you can't do it then and there, you just adopt the bailout procedure, which is drain and uh, uh, wait for another day for somebody else to do the job better than you. So how do we, de how do we deal with this bile duct uh, injury? Uh, it depends on when you see it. Um, I know it's a busy slide here, but I just want you to um, concentrate on the, on the left-hand side of your, your screen. Uh, can you, yeah. So, um, what you see here is basically uh, a slide which tells you what to do if the problem is recognized intraoperatively, 
post-op early, which is less than six weeks, post-op delayed more than six weeks. Now, we're only going to concentrate on the left side because the other you know, post-op early and late have been dealt with by my colleagues. So intraoperatively, so if you can deal with laparoscopically, yes. If not, attempt an open repair. If it is a Strasbourg type A, which is just a, basically a leak from a cystic duct or from an aberrant right hepatic, no harm, you know, ligating it, you know, putting a suture, if you can suture it, if your laparoscopic skills are good enough, or clip it and drain the liver bed. If it's a type D injury, a lateral injury, again, it is perfectly acceptable to primarily suture it um, and, then, uh, and then put a drain outside. Uh, you know, and then you can always uh, think about uh, an ERCT and stenting in the post-operative period if things don't work. Uh, the bottom part of your uh, uh, of your screen there, uh, the emphasis here is on the other type of injuries, the Bs and the Cs and the E1s to E5s. Now, as you can see there, they've categorized it into into two broad uh, categories. One is when there is a loss of substance. This is really really important. If it's a scissors injury, there is no loss of substance. But if it is a diathermy injury or if it is a uh, if it is a um, uh, energy device like a harmonic injury, there is a loss of substance. Now the studies have consistently shown that if it is a complete injury, uh, even if it is a complete injury, but if there is no loss of substance, you are perfectly okay to uh, to suture it primarily. Um, uh, and, and leave a drain outside. Now there is a difference of opinion about whether you need to put a T-tube in or not. Again, with T-tubes, there are two kinds of T-tubes that uh, that have been proposed. One is the uh, ex externalized T-tube and the other is a Y-tube, wherein the two ends of the Y go to the right and the left hepatic ducts and the long end goes along the bile duct. Now, you know, the, 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 the jury is open about which is better, but the point being, if there is no loss of substance, you're okay to do it primarily, suture it primarily on a drain. But if there is a loss of substance or if there's a significant terminal injury, please do not attempt a primary suturing and go for, uh, well, go just go for a, a ruin y hepatic or jejunostomy. And that's what uh, you see here um, on the flow chart denoted as bilo, bilio digestive anastomosis. Now, this is another flow chart, <clears throat> except that over here, they've categorized the uh, the, the bile duct uh, injury into a simple bile leak, a minor lesion, and a complex lesion. Again, if it's a simple bile leak, you're absolutely fine to put a suture and put a drain outside. If it's a minor leak, uh, intraoperative suture, again, uh, drain outside, you may have to consider an ERCP, the postoperative period, depending on the clinical progress. If it's a complex lesion, you uh, take a call whether you want to carry on laparoscopic or convert to open. And if you, whatever you do, whether it's laparoscopic or open, the, the prime factor for you to determine what operation you have to do on that patient will, determine, will, will depend on whether there's tissue loss or no tissue loss. If there's tissue loss, you go for a, um, a, a ruin y hepatic jejunostomy. If there isn't, then you can consider uh, primary suturing. And again, um, whether you do it over a T-tube or not, uh, internalized or externalized, these are subjects of debate and discussion. So I would like to conclude by saying that uh, um, intraoperative bile duct injury during laparoscopic cholecystectomy is a rare complication, but yet preventable. It needs to be prevented. One needs to be familiar with the uh, adjuncts, the, 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 the good old IOCs, but also the, 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 the newer ones, the laparoscopic ultrasound and the near infrared uh, fluoroscopy and so on. But then that's, that should not be regarded uh, as a replacement for not adhering to the safe principles of laparoscopic process. The learning curve and the mentoring are key aspects to prevent bile duct injuries. And the best repair is usually the first repair surgeon. If that cannot be achieved, if you're in trouble, the best option would be the bailout option, which is to abandon the operation, drain, and refer to the appropriate specialist. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. And once again, apologies for the technical hitch earlier on in the presentation. Thank you.